Hello and welcome to Algorithms Live. This week uh, we'll be covering convex hull optimization. So extending on this idea of um, solution bags. Uh, and when, one neat thing about this technique is it's not really related to convex hull um, in terms of actually being a hull that you pull out. Um, it's a little more related to convex envelopes and convex regions formed by lines. Um, and it's a way of speeding up certain classes of dynamic programming. So you'll, you'll be seeing that today. We'll show two examples that are a little bit different. Um, so it, this is probably a fairly advanced topic for some people. And uh, so if you have any questions or thoughts on the subject, uh, Leave them in the live comments. I'll try to check that periodically. And that way, we'll know exactly what's going on. All right. So other things. Um, so this week is also a big week for anyone that's competing in high school uh, tournaments. Um, so the USACO is going on right now. Uh, the US Open. So you can check that out on USACO. It's active this weekend. Uh, it's the last contest before the USACO camp. And uh, usually pretty hard, but pretty good problems. Um, so if you end up taking that contest, uh, you can take it. It's a five hour contest anytime during the weekend. Um, pretty cool uh, contest itself. Um, also, this coming week, for those of you that are high school students in the US, uh, there's the HSPT. Um, you can find out more about that here. And this is just an on-site contest here at UCF. And we're excited to see all the teams that are coming out and competing in this contest. Uh, and that will take place I believe Wednesday of this coming week, or Thursday. Yeah, Thursday of this coming week. Of the date, dates mixed around in my head. Uh, so good luck to all the teams that are competing in that. Uh, for people that aren't in the US and uh, um, aren't in high school, you can see some of the past problems uh, on this site. Uh, they're really targeted for high school students in the US. And uh, so they, they are a bit easier, but then there are some harder problems uh, on the harder side of those sets. So. Good training for beginners as well. Um, last thing, last uh, last bit of housekeeping before we begin uh, is Algorithms Live. We're, we're being visited by the USACO director next week here at UCF. So I'm moving Algorithms Live out of the way for that. Uh, and we, the, it'll take place at a special time next week, probably on Sunday probably around the same time the at coder episode took place. So if you watch that, it was um, maybe 1 p.m. or noon here in the US on the East Coast. Um, but you can look that up in your local time zone. And I'll put an announcement out um, before, before that episode begins uh, on the blog and so forth. And next week's episode, a very popular request is the um, Divide and Conquer on Trees, or Centroid Decomposition Technique. So that's going to be next week's episode. We're going to go into that, show a few examples of um, Divide and Conquer on Trees. Uh, there's also a data structure that Centroid Decomposition that I'm not going to get into that week, but in future weeks I will be getting into, um, try to have a special guest on uh, the week after. So I still have to contact them. but. Um, it could be really cool to see a combination of centroid decomposition techniques and this technique today, which is convex hull optimization. All right, let's let's dive right in though for for convex hull optimization. So our first problem that we're going to study. Um, I should put this back in tablet mode. Okay, so <clears throat> it's called covered walkway. I believe this problem was written by Brian Dean, who's the um, USACO director. 
And this problem I'm fairly familiar with because uh, it was in the 2012 Chicago Invitational. And uh, it's a contest I competed in. And this is the precursor to NAIPC. Um, so fa fairly familiar with this problem, mainly because we didn't solve it in, in contest. Um, so here's the idea. We basically have a number line, and we have some points we'd like to cover on this number line. So maybe these are the positions of things on the number line. 15 all the way out to 30. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to cover the, uh, the regions, something like that, and do the minimum cost covering of these regions. So we'd like to basically cover intervals of points. Um, so there's this cost C that's given to you in the problem. It's the same for every interval. And it's described as a contractor cost. Um, so, so given in each case, you basically have this contractor cost. And it's basically just the cost to start any covering. All right. And we like to make the minimum cost for a covering. So that's just the um, start of an interval. It ends up being cost C. Um, but the whole cost of covering an interval of points is going to be this formula. So and so I'll write this one out. It's x minus y squared plus c. Um, well, it really should be yeah, x minus y. Yeah, I'll do it that way. So this is the leftmost point in the interval. So in this case, maybe this point over here on the left. And this is the rightmost point on the interval. Maybe this point here. And so the cost of this interval up here covering 1 through 4 would be 4 minus 1 squared, which comes out to 9, plus whatever the cost of C is. And that would be the cost of covering an interval like that. And so what, what we'd like to do is we'd like to know the minimum cost to produce a whole covering. And that's just going to be the sum of all the coverings of individual intervals. So this one will just be cost C. This one will be cost C. And as you can see, there are many different ways we could cover up the intervals. If the number of intervals, the cost gets huge, I might try something like that or I might try doing the entire interval, or I might try putting everything in their own interval, in which case the distance between them is cost zero, but there's a contractor cost to cover the point. And so I'd just like to know the minimum cost for the entire interval. <coughs> so let's try to come up with a few ideas. Um, and what we'd like to do for these ideas is we'd like to go back to our idea of solution bags. So maybe this is our, our bag. And I'd like to put things into this partial solution. So the first idea maybe that comes to mind is doing something like keep all possible coverings. And so I'd have something with intervals here. And then maybe there's a last interval that's being expanded out to the right. So we're, we just have all possible coverings of the intervals. So this is good because I could know what my current cost is completely, but I don't know anything um, else in terms of um, my solution. <clears throat> all right, yeah, it, it's basically way too complicated. Uh, there'd be way too many states if I kept it like this. So we'll make a few observations about the structure. Um, only the last interval is really being expanded at all uh, to cover any points. It might continue on. I might try to end it and start a new interval covering. And all of these are already paid for. So all that really matters is the cost of the predecessors here. I don't really need to keep all this around. I could keep it fuzzy. 
and just say, what was the minimum cost I could cover before I started this interval here, and then tried expanding it out further. So that simplifies my partial solution. And this is just a piece I'd like to extend on and on and on uh, that ends up being the last possible ending at that position. So we end up getting something to characterize our partial solution. In the last two weeks, we've been seeing this as a tuple, but sometimes they get more complicated. So the only information, what's the information we need to keep around of our partial solution as we're exploring points in order? So what I'm going to do is going into this interval, I'm going to try to be exploring my points in order from left to right. And I'd like to keep track of the partial solution for intervals up to that point. So the only things I need to keep track of, where did this interval start? Like what was the x coordinate where this interval started? And that will tell me exactly how much I'm paying by trying to end at this y coordinate right here. So there might be a y coordinate in question. I'd like to know what's the min cost of ending it right there. <clears throat> the other thing is I need to know the cost of everything before me, cost of the previous nodes. And that's this piece right here. What, what's the cost of the things behind me? I don't have to know what those intervals are. I don't have to know any extra information about them. But I'd like to keep track of what is behind me. Um, and so what I'll do to transfer to start a new interval is I just consider ending at the position that was right before me, consider ending it, get that cost, and then I can use it to um, pay forward uh, this next interval that I'm starting. Now, my, I also have this cost C for starting an interval. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to include it in my previous cost. So I'll, I'll just say that this cost right here includes my C values. That's the contractor cost. And what you're going to notice with this piece right here, this is enough to calculate the partial solution. <clears throat> okay, so what I can do is I can just, every time I come across a new point, I can just calculate what's the minimum cost to get everything behind me, um, and then put it into the bag. So we already have our first question, and it's asking for this algorithm, is it a greedy algorithm? Uh, and no, this, is, this comes back to this idea of solution bags. Um, what I am what I'm going to be doing is keeping around all the costs, uh, all the possible partial solutions I have in my solution. Um, so it's much more like dynamic programming. Uh, the, the big difference here is instead of having a table that's keeping track of my partial solutions where I'm building it up to, I instead have a bag, a data structure, that's going to hold all possible partial solutions. Um, and I have basically said anything that starts an interval here and then continues on, uh, there's pieces behind me. It doesn't really matter what the pieces behind me are. It just matters how much it costs to end at this location, whatever this last point was, and then continue on starting my new partial solution. All right, so let's go code this thing. Uh, seeing some code might be helpful and trying to understand it. And what I'm going to do first is this algorithm is going to be too slow. Um, so I'll just code a slow solution. But if the bounds were a little smaller, I, I guess I should talk about bounds uh, on things from this problem. So the coordinate space, our x's um, that start off in our values, so x sub i's, this is going to be up to 10 to the ninth. Our values for the cost, the predecessor costs, up to uh, contractor costs are also up to 10 to the 9. And n is going to be somewhere between having one element or having 10 to the fifth elements. But as you're going to see, our algorithm is going to be too slow for that. But the solution bag solution without any optimizations could work if n was 1,000 here. What you're going to see in a moment is the algorithm I'm going to implement is actually n squared. But our n 10 to the fifth is the runtime that we need to actually solve this problem. 
This is going to be way too slow. But this is definitely the way I, I would actually code it if the bounds were up to 1,000. Uh, I find that the, you can code solution bags without a fancy optimization or without a fancy data structure. And I find that the, sometimes the implementation is a lot simpler than if I did a DP table. Um, and you may see that here. So I'm just going to solve the version of the problem if the bounds are up to 1,000. So the input works like this, n is the number of points that I end up having. So I'll just um, read that in. And then I might care what's the cost that I currently have up to and including this point. right? And so basically, I need something to keep track of my bag. Um, I need to keep track of my partial solution. So let's take a look at what a partial solution will look like. I'll just make a quick little class for that. Um, I have some starting location, and I have the previous cost in front of me. Uh, and that's all the information I need to figure out what my partial solution is. And so the x is just the start of the very last interval, and that previous cost is just the cost of everything before me that I paid for. I'm using longs because I'm pretty sure it can overflow an int. Um, that squaring of positions is getting pretty big. And because uh, everything's up to 10 to the ninth, so I want to avoid things like that. Being a little bit lazy with my naming here, that's OK. And I'll also write a helper function called get cost. So all this is doing is I'm saying, what happens if I end this interval at y? Um, how much cost am I paying? So the first thing I do is I just get the distance between the two coordinates, so x and y. And if you remember, the formula is that distance squared plus the previous cost of everything in front of me. Pretty good. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a bag of these partial solutions. Up to and including this point. And then I also need to keep track of what was the best thing behind me. So I'm going to have a variable for that. So what's the best way I covered the point right before me? And if I'm right at the start, I don't have a point right before me. So this is going to just be 0, uh, something I'm going to keep around. And now I can go through every single point in order. Uh, they guarantee that the points are given to me an input in, in order of increasing order. Um, so that's really nice. I don't have to read them in and sort them or do anything complicated like that. So I could read in this first x, uh, and then I can make a new partial solution off that x. So this is the new partial solutions um, position. And so the previous cost, the thing behind me, is the best possible previous cost that I could have earned. But I also need to add in the contractor cost of starting this new interval. So this is where I'm going to pay for it here. I'm going to keep track of the solution behind me. <clears throat> and so then I want to find the best solution. Uh, I need to update that. So I have this long that's the best solution covering the last point I did. I need to update that for everything behind me. Um, so I don't want to keep around the best being 0 all the time. That's not going to work. Um, so I'm just going to assume it's some outrageously large value. If you're in Java, integer long dot max value, um, pretty useful here. And I'll just go through every possible partial solution in my bag and update that. keeping the best previous, and that's that's my solution. That's all I have to do. Um, you'll notice this piece right here, finding the best remaining solution behind me, finding the, this predecessor. This could be up to O of n, because our bag, I'm adding this new thing to, oh, I'm not adding it to the bag. So I need to add a partial solution to the bag. So I make this new partial solution, add it to my bag. 
I'm adding it every time. What you'll notice here is it's basically increasing the size of the bag each for loop. So the runtime is a uh, summation from one to n. Um, because every single time this loop is running that i in that summation in runtime. Um, so you can do, if you know some algorithm analysis, uh, two nested for loops. It's basically that the analysis is very similar to if you had two nested for loops like this, but started j at i. And if you do some, and then maybe do work here, um, if this is O of n work, or O of 1 work right in here, then this for loop is actually O of n squared. Um, so it's even though it's a summation, it's a little bit faster than the worst case, it's still n squared, not going to be fast enough on the worst possible cases for this problem. Uh, but we can test this out, make sure it's at least working on samples. Um, we'll test the bigger one. And this is the sample outputs. If you look at uh, Caddis, Here's the test case that 3726 uh, is the runtime of this algorithm, or uh, is the correct sample output. OK, so let's get back to analyzing this problem a little bit further. Um, so what we've done is we've kept track of these partial solutions so far. And we've kept track of, um, we're basically keeping all of them around. And if we look back at this code, so uh, we'll, we'll just take a quick look back at this code. Um, eek. You'll notice the slow part of my algorithm is this line right here, this for loop. We, we got to do something about this for loop. We need to know what's the minimum possible best previous at any given time. And we're, we're currently not doing that. Um, and so that's why we need to make a better data structure than a bag. So a bag is just keeping everything around. It's not organizing the data. I'm using an array deck for my bag. I could have used a linked list. Um, doesn't really matter. So there's really no structure. There's no ordering to these elements that's relevant that is helping me out. Um, so that's what I'd like to improve about the algorithm. <coughs> OK, so let's list our needs maybe a little bit better. Um, so here are our needs. So we need to find the best thing right now. So You need to find the best cost ending at position x at any given time. Uh, and of course, this is for all x all throughout the solution. And the other thing we need to do is we need to be able to add a new partial solution. So once we figure out what's the minimum cost to cut off our predecessor, how do we add a new partial solution to the answer? So let's take a look at this equation. Um, it's basically x minus y squared plus previous cost. That's, that's the equation that's going to be fueling our runtime. Um, and if you take a look at this, because really this is just some value offset from x, this is what our partial solution looks like geometrically. Well, maybe not that vertical, but it, it is a parabola. And so what you'll realize is partial solutions are quadratic equations. or at least the positive half of the quadratic equations. Uh, let's take a look at some of these. Um, they're kind of interesting. So let's say I have two of them here. And what you'll notice is after this one becomes active, after we end up hitting this point, this one is just always better. Uh, 
Um, but that's not that's not the case in all possible cases. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll have a solution. The cost is going up, and then I'll end it end an interval earlier. So my next start is going to start a little higher, but then I end up having a quadratic equation like this. And you'll notice the derivative of these quadratic equations are always the same. Um, so that gives us a really interesting property. If this is the intersection point, so like right there's the intersection point. Since they all have the same derivative, uh, this intersects exactly once. Right, <clears throat> and another another interesting property. If I can look at this, is I look. This is curve one, curve two. Um, later starting curves uh, always surpass their predecessor. Uh, th other thing I want to point out, um, is these curves are representing the partial solutions. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I mentioned that before. <clears throat> okay, so what we could do is we know one ends up overtaking the other, so maybe we end up having a bunch of these curves going up like this. And what I could do is this is the optimal solution as I'm going along, and then all of a sudden it gets overtaken by the second one, and then that's the optimal solution going along because we want that minimum. And then this one ends up being the optimal solution running along, and we're just going to run along this curve. And so what we're basically doing is just riding the chain of best solutions. So what I could do is I could have a data structure that basically as I'm walking, uh, as I basically maintain the leftmost curve because I can process these curves in order. And then as soon as something overtakes something else, I can replace it. I'm never going to have to consider this curve again. This curve is now always at least better than that previous curve. And I can just switch it out and keep going. Um, so the idea there is I could just keep a deck of curves. or at least the Q, uh, I'm going to change it to a deck later. Uh, and the reason I'm going to change it to a deck is look at this tricky case. So here's one thing that could happen that could throw a wrench into my, uh, my plans. Is let's say I have a curve here, and it's increasing like this. Something like that. Uh, quadratic curve. Draw that nicely. Um, and then I could have a curve here that overtakes it. And then I could have a curve that starts a little later. And they're all supposed to be ah, like that. I guess it never ends up intersecting. So this is curve one. This one starts the earliest. This is curve two. It starts a little later. And then that's the third curve to start. And so what you'll notice here that makes this tricky is in my data structure, one and two are going to be adjacent. This is where they overtake each other. But node three that gets added a little later ends up taking overtaking node two earlier in our data structure. So if they were adjacent in our data structure, if I'm, if I'm putting them adjacent in our queue, this is one, two, three, I'm only going to compare these two versus comparing these two and I end up having this problem that if I'm taking my minimum, just comparing it to the next thing, then I won't know to throw this one out at this particular time because I'm waiting to throw it out that much later. So I'll get a suboptimal solution, and that's no good. I, 
I want to have the optimal solution for all possible x coordinates at every given time. So we need to resolve that issue. Um, so this is where we end up coming up with a, a deck. I'm going to be putting things on top of this data structure. So it's a double-ended queue. So you can think of it like a stack, but I'm allowed to remove things from the bottom of the stack as well as the top of the stack. Um, and I'll be checking to make sure that these times right here end up um, basically forming this nice chain of best solutions. I, I'd like to basically ensure that the time this ends up getting overtaken by this is less than the time that this gets overtaken by this. So what we need to do is maintain some invariance on our data structure that are making our solution bag a little more specific. So it's no longer a bag now, it's a deck. And it's no longer just a deck, it's got a deck with some invariants that we'd like to maintain. So here are our invariants. So I have some x coordinates. Those are our positions. And what I'd like to do is if these are satisfied, if the x is less than xj is less than xk, and this is the order on the stack, then I'd like to ensure that the time that j overtakes i, so I'm writing to, so time overtaken, that's basically going to be a function. That's what I'm defining as TO. Um, so the time that J overtakes I should be strictly less than the time that K overtakes I. That's the invariant I'd like to maintain. And so what we'll get is this nice chain of solutions always going up as we move from left to right. And that's what I'd like to maintain. So <clears throat> let's take a look at this. The, the first thing is this property is transitive. Um, so what I mean by that is if um, I and J meet this property in, uh, I guess, uh, three-way transitive, but it's basically if um, three triplets meet these properties and then another three triplets meet these properties, then uh, sticking something in the middle, like basically all triplets will meet these properties, which is kind of nice. Um, and so I only really need to maintain it at the top of my data structure, uh, or actually not the top of my data structure, but basically all adjacent pairs in my data structure, or all adjacent triplets, if I ensure that all adjacent triplets, so one, two, three, triplet, one, two, three, triplet in terms of a stack, if I basically maintain it for all triplets, I've maintained it throughout my data structure for things that aren't consecutive. Um, so I could have a triplet like this in my data structure, and it'll also be maintained because this property is transitive. So pretty cool. <coughs> I'd also like to maintain a second invariant on my data structure. If i is less than j on my data structure, I'd like to ensure that it's increasing. So x of i needs to be less than x of j, um, just working forward. And this is what allows me to maintain it as a deck instead of something more complicated. Because I could just, as I'm coming across new x's, I can add them to the end of the deck and then pop off things that aren't meeting my invariant. All right, so we do have one more thing we need to do before we could start coding this thing. Um, I need to be able to calculate this function. So TO of IJ, or JI. I need to know for a given J and a given I, when does J overtake I? And so there are a couple ways to do this. Uh, one, we could solve for the intersection point. Um, between two quadratic equations. 
that's that's solution one. Uh, and the first thing you'll notice about this solution is it's going to involve doubles and a square root. Doubles, yuck. I don't really want to deal with that. If I can keep doubles out of my code, things are going to be better. Um, but we also re recognize there was a neat property with this these curves here is they're always going to overtake if this x coordinate comes later. You end up overtaking it with the right piece. Um, so this basically just allows us to binary search for the place where it overtakes. And so I'll just put in a binary search um, for that overtaking piece. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll have my deck. It'll look something like this. I'm just adding things to the back of the deck. And so what will happen is this new partial solution will go on the back of the deck. And what I'll maintain at the bottom of the deck right here is the best solution. And the best solution right now at this x that I'm caring about. Um, so I'll basically be removing things from the bottom as they become obsolete, writing that chain of best solutions. So uh, basically, when this overtakes this, I'll, I'll switch over to this new curve. And then since I'm maintaining that invariant that allows us to ride that nice chain, um, I'll do that by adding things to the back of my data structure and popping off elements as they get overtaken, as they don't meet the invariant. So I need to look at the back behind me. OK, so let's actually code this thing. Uh, what you're going to see is it's just going to be a small modification from our solution bag idea. Uh, so our solution bag didn't have much structure. Um, but now what we're going to do is actually make it a little more powerful and use this deck to support things. OK, so let, let's make some changes. First off, let's get rid of this bag. Uh, I'm going to replace it with a double-ended queue. Now, I'm going to need to look at the previous two solutions in my deck um, coming from the back of the queue. And so I find that for most decks in either, either Java, C++, except maybe Python, um, the natural implementation of deck, like array deck, isn't very helpful for this. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to implement this with an array. Um, and keep track of these partial solutions. So this is my deck. It's just an array of size n. <laughs> I'm going to keep track of a front pointer. That's the front of my double-ended queue. I'm going to keep track of a back pointer. That's the back of my double-ended queue. And so the back, I'm going to treat more like a stack. The front, I can just pull things off. I'm not really going to push things on in terms of my queue. Um, I'm just going to pull them off as things come obsolete. So I can implement this using an array. If I needed to push things onto the front, I'd switch over to an array deck because it would get messy. Um, but since I'm only adding and removing to the back, and since I'm only removing from the front, these will work fine. OK, so we can keep everything else. Um, let's move down here. Let's look at this uh, partial solution piece. So we need to implement this function I'm going to call time overtaken um, because that's going to just tell me when a solution overtakes something else and it'll make the rest of the algorithm easier to implement. So here's what I'll do. I just need to find the time that one overtakes the other. I'm going to keep it in longs for safety. I don't really know if I need them. Uh, so the way this function works is it's going to be the time that this right-hand side variable uh, overtakes where I currently am. So I'll, I'll write in a comment, time that RHS overtakes this. OK? So my binary search, I'm going to start off low is right-hand side diet x. What's the upper bound for when x overtakes y? Well, if you think about this, you're like, I don't really know. Um, it could overtake it a lot later. I could use a long, long something close to long.max value. I might overflow. If I use integer.max value, I'm not really sure if that's when it overtakes it. Um, so when I get in these situations, sometimes I write my binary search a little differently. I write my binary search to say the right-hand side.x. So 
basically, I want to start comparing time over taken. So if I have two curves, here, let's look back at the two curves. Um, I only really care to start the lower bound of my binary search because this one might already be better than the curve behind me. So I'm just going to start on the right-hand side's curve. Um, you'll notice I started my high as exactly the same. What we're going to do is we're going to keep doubling what our high is until it basically overtakes the right-hand side curve. So that way I don't have to know what the high value should be, and I won't have a bug where my high value was too low. So what I'll do is I'll move low to, I, I've already tested high, so I know it's not the lowest thing. And then I just double what high is. So it's basically doing the reverse of a binary search to find what the upper bound of the binary search is. Um, so I, I learned this trick, and I thought it was really cool. So now I'll do your typical stereotypical binary search. Uh, search from low to high. I just take the midpoint first. Uh, so I'll do a long for the midpoint. <coughs> so I'll do low plus high divided by 2. Um, and I'll get the two costs. Cost of m equal to right hand side get cost of m. And that's the upper bound of my binary search. Then I can look at the lower bound of my binary search as m plus i, m plus 1. There we go. So we have the upper bound on our, um, our binary search. This basically just tells me when this gets overtaken. I'm just binary searching for that position. <coughs> OK, so let's modify the rest of this. So I can't put it in the bag just yet. So I'll modify this maintaining the invariant piece. To insert it into my deck, I have to maintain that the top of my bag actually makes sense. Um, so what I'll do here is I need to maintain that property, the time overtaken property for all triplets in my data structure. Uh, so the first thing I'll do is just make sure that I have at least three things I'm dealing with. Um, so there'll be two in my data structure and my partial solution that I'm going to add. <coughs> and I just look at second to last thing. And I get the time it overtakes the last thing. Oh, maybe not a DP. And I compare that to the current thing's time overtaken. And then I move my stack pointer down. And so once I find a reasonable place to insert this into my deck, I just add it to the back of my deck. OK, looking pretty good. Uh, and then the second thing I need to do is maintain what's the best interval. So that's just adding it to the bag. Now I can get rid of this order and check. So the way I'll do this um, is just walk through my queue, and I'll get the best cost at x. And if it's greater than or equal to the next thing in my queue at x, then I look back here, this has finally overtaken this at this x value. So I'm just replacing it. I'm moving my pointer up. And so that what that ensures is the best possible ending position for this interval. If I were to end right at this x, that best possible position is right here. So I'll pull it out right now. And that's the algorithm. 
So it, it's basically just walking over this data structure. So I've replaced my bag with this fancy data structure, and now I can just maintain it. So let's see if it's uh, still passing samples. Ooh. Get cost. Oh, I guess I should change these to be lungs. No big deal. And I believe it's still passing samples. So we'll see if we can get this right. And accepted. So not not too fast on the CPU time, but still pretty decent. Um, yeah. So not a very long solution at all for the this this problem. Okay. So that. That's covered walkway. So now we can actually start going into what convex hull optimization is. Um, so that problem is kind of convex hull optimization. It's not really a convex hull. The curves aren't lines. Uh, the curves are other things. Uh, the second problem, machine works, that I'm going to be going over, is really what you would call convex hull optimization. You're actually dealing with hulls, and that's what you're maintaining. Um, but it's, you'll notice it has a very similar pattern to this, this problem we just solved, this um, covered walkway problem. So let's talk about machine works. And so this is from ICPC World Finals in 2011. And so there's this problem called machine works. And the way this works is you have a you have some days, so time is passing, and then you have some ending day that's given to you D. So this is um, the ending day. And what you'd like to do is you'd like to potentially buy machines. So here's a machine M1 or machine M2 or machine M3. And they're coming in at different days, so machine one will be available. But if you don't purchase it right on that day, then the machine is gone forever. You can't buy it ever again. Um, so days are going by. Machines are becoming available. Um, so this is the passage of time in days. Uh, another thing is you can only know own one machine at a time. That's a detail in the problem. And another thing is, let's talk about the machines. So it's going to be available on some day DI. Okay, and this machine generates some money. Some amount of money per day. Uh, other things. So if we want to buy this machine, it's going to cost PI dollars. And so what about resale? So we could resell the machine for our I dollars. So machine becomes available. If you have PI dollars, you can buy this machine. Um, once you have the machine, you can start using it the next day. And it will make you GI dollars per day every single day after that. And then after you're done with the machine, like you actually don't want it anymore, 
uh, you can sell it back for RI dollars. Um, so how do you buy machines? Well, you're given some initial money. And that's given to you as this value C. And so what we'd like to do is just buy some machines, um, potentially buy one machine, potentially sell it on some day, and then buy a new machine that makes more money, then sell it, and then buy a new machine that makes more money. And by the end of all this time, what we'd like to have is the most amount of money possible uh, in the problem. Uh, <clears throat> another annoying thing about this problem uh, that was nice in the other problem is the days are not in order. Um, so nice thing about the last problem is the x-coordinates were coming in in order. They were going on, but now they're, they're actually not in order at all. Um, so we're going to have to sort them. <coughs> so let's, let's talk about ideas for attacking this thing. And I'd like to first try solving it solution bag style. Um, so what we can do is keep track of the machines. And we also want to know when they're owned. So what I could have is this is maybe an interval of one machine that I owned, and then I sold it, and then I had this machine that I owned for a while, then I sold it, then I had this machine I owned for a while, and this very last machine maybe we, keeps generating money until the very last day. Um, and you'll notice we have a very similar structure to that of the last problem. So we're extending the last machine in use. It's kind of like extending the last interval of the covering in the last problem. And this cost of everything behind me is really what matters. The uh, reward, basically the reward generated is all that matters here for behind us. So if we know the best possible cost for selling a machine right at that moment, what's the maximum amount of money I can make? It could be just holding on to all my money. Keep that in mind. Don't necessarily have to buy machines. Um, and I, I just want to know what's the maximum money I can make the day before I'm going to buy my next machine. Um, so a way to characterize that is we need to know the max money uh, that we can have at any day D. You need to know that. Uh, so we can do it a few things. We could use it to buy a machine. What else can we do? Well, the answer is the maximum money obtained on the very last day. So we need it for the answer as well. Uh, so there's this reward generated behind me. After I finished off my last machine, I could sell it back for more money. Um, well, maybe we don't want to keep track of that. that. That's annoying to keep track of. I can do is I can make the resale value it can be factored into my previous cost to simplify things. And so you can think of it as like, I've already, I got um, an advance on my resale money before I even sold the machines. I'm just reworking the cost to make my life easier. Okay, so now, now we get to our solution bag. So our bag is going to have all these partial solutions that I'm generating at a given time. And so here's my, what my partial solutions are looking like so, so far. I need to know the start, start day. So when did this machine start? When did it start making money for me? And what was the day of that? Because if I know that, then I know how much money it's made on day X so far. Um, I need to know what's the money it generates? How much money does it generate per day? Because if I do um, start, Machine starting on this day, take that second location, 
multiply it by the money that it generates, and then I have how much money it made after I days. <clears throat> and then the next one is like, what's the profit before buying the machine? So I could stockpile some of that money so I could use it to also buy future machines. So it it's basically comes down to this value plus the resale value. And that's enough to characterize my partial solution. I don't actually need any more information um, than that to characterize how my partial solution works. So this is good enough to implement a slower n squared version of this problem. So I guess we should talk a little bit about bounds. Um, in this problem, all the days, the days can be up to 10 to the ninth. Uh, a lot of the, um, the money we can earn, the money that the machine generates is also up to 10 to the ninth, but the number of machines available is only up to 10 to the fifth. So I'll keep, keep that in mind. Uh, and I want an N squared algorithm in terms of N. So it's going to work very similar to, um, before. And then we're going to figure out how to speed it up. Oh, wrong code. So machine works. Take a look at this. So I've already read in some input here. Um, the first one is the number of days I have. Uh, all zeros end up generating the final answer. Um, so if n is zero, I know to quit. Um, this is, ooh, that's the initial money I have. And this is the very last day of the operation. So this is when I can sell back my last machine and get some money for it, <laughs> for when it was generated. So let's grab the machines. I'm going to make an array of things called machines. So let's make a machine class uh, to, to keep track of these various machines. Um, so in the input, it's characterized what day it's available, what's the price of the machine. Uh, not priv price, what's the resale value of this machine, and what's the money that the machine makes per day? The information we need. Uh, what I'll do is I don't want to read things in and then pass them around, so I'll just make um, an input generator. Okay, so that's the machines. Uh, I'd like to read them in. It's looking pretty good. And the problem is they're not sorted by day. I want to sort them by day, so. is fortunately my VI highlights that arrow which is kind of sad that's okay and so if you're not familiar this is a nice Java 8 feature for sorting uh, you can basically avoid writing all that comparator nonsense that takes up a lot of space um, okay, so we need a bag for our solution bag. So we need to keep track of partial solutions and put them in a bag. Uh, so that's what I'll, I'll generate here. And I'm going to use that to go through my machines and figure out like what's the best at any given time. Um, so I need to make a solution class. 
So I have a start time, I have money per day, and I have the previous money that is available. Those were how we characterize our solution. So what's the first day this machine is available? How much money does it make per day? And what's the previous money we had before we had this machine? Um, so I'll read in some of this input here. I'll be a little bit lazy once again. <clears throat> it's a great way to make a bug for yourself though. So, so you shouldn't copy and paste like this, but I do it all the time. Um, looks good. So I made my little constructor here and how much money does this earn on day day? I'm going to have a little helper function here. So I'll pass in a day and it'll tell me how much money that ends up making. Um, to make sure I don't overflow along, I'll just or over one and I'll just do the current day minus the start. So this thing is assuming that I'm starting on day start. It's day day. Um, how many days have passed since the start of the day? Uh, you'll notice that this equation basically means I can't start making money right when I buy the machine. And the problem, it says you can't use the machine on the day you buy it. So it works out. We don't have to worry about uh, this equation being weird. So we'll do money per day multiplied by this value plus the previous money available. Okay, and this is the total money earned if we sold the machine right now on day day. Um, once we have that information, we can get the answer. Okay, so let's run our algorithm to figure out what the optimal solution is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep a variable that tells me what's the max money I can earn. So the max money I could earn is C. This is just the money I was given initially. I might be able to earn that, uh, and that's it. I'm just going to run through my machines one at a time in order by days. Uh, the first thing I need to do is consider selling a machine right before today. Um, I can't sell it on the day I buy a new machine. Or wait, I can sell it on the day I buy a new machine, but I can't sell it while it's making money. So I have to sell it the day before. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just loop through all possible solutions in my solution bag and update the max money I can earn. Okay, so this basically takes care of this machine isn't worth buying, it's too expensive. So if the machine is more expensive than the max money I can earn right now, I just get out of here. Uh, I can't afford this machine, even if I saved all my money, even if I used machines up till now optimally. Uh, so now we need to know what's the previous money for my new partial solution. So it's how much money I could have possibly earned up to this day minus paying for the machine. So I have to buy the machine. I can add back the resale value right away um, because I'm getting that machine back. Now, I, I don't get an advance on that money when I'm buying the machine. Now, I have to make sure I still have enough money uh, before paying that money. So you can't just read in the input and ignore price and only consider price minus resale. Um, I actually need more information with that. That's OK. So what day am I on? That's the previous money. And I have a new partial solution. 
the partial solutions are generated. I'm, I've bought a new machine. This is the machine I'm going to use till the end of time. That's what each of these partial solutions are. And once again, you'll notice it's the exact same problem I had last time. I'm adding a new partial solution after every single iteration. Um, so this algorithm right now, because I'm looping over the solution bag to find to update my max money, is too slow. It's n squared. But I'll go through each solution in the bag at the very end. And I need to look at what's the max money I can earn on the last day D. I, so basically what I'm doing is looping through all possible machines, figuring out what's the best one for that case. <laughs> And that's the money I can earn up to and including that point. E. Long to int. All right. Thanks for so long. Oh, yeah, I need to actually run this thing. Let's see if it passes samples. Um, Yes. The past samples, uh, the first sample is 44. Um, so this is working. Let, I actually have the data from World Finals downloaded. So um, this is the machine works data. You'll notice it actually runs pretty fast. So these should all be correct, it seems. Um, until you get out to case 46, so that's some of the larger cases. It's actually starting to run pretty slow. Um, so unfortunately, this is just going to super TLE. Uh, it's not just not going to be fast enough. So I should probably just stop running it now. But it is generating uh, some of these cases. So this is definitely the solution I would run if the bounds were like 10,000 or the bounds were like 5,000 um, for n number of machines. I, I would just write something like this. I, I find it's not as complicated as the dynamic programming. Um, to write something like this, I can just write it uh, and it'll work. But that's too slow. So we're going to try to speed it up. So this comes down to we want to replace our bag with something more useful in terms of the data structure. Uh, so let's look at our needs again. So what's making our data structure slow or what's making this algorithm slow? Well, if I look at the code, so maybe I, I take another look at this code. This for loop right here is the slow part. I'm looping over um, everything in the bag, and that, that's just way too slow right now. So I'd like to fix that, make that actually fast. Um, so this is basically just telling you what's the max money at a given position. Uh, <clears throat> this part right here is pretty fast right now, adding it to the bag. But I also need to be able to do that insertion pretty fast. Um, so the two things I need to know how to do are need to calculate the max money at any given day. Uh, what's the second thing I need to do? I need to be able to add a solution to my data structure quickly. So right now, this is actually working pretty fast. But sometimes when you try to satisfy the first requirement, the second requirement doesn't come with it for free. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so what do our partial solutions look like geometrically? That that's really going to be the crux here. Um, so let's move down a little bit. They're basically lines. 
right? So every time I resell it, I go up a little bit and I'm making a little bit more profit each day. So the total profit from the first day that I ended up having this machine to the eighth day could be perceived as a line. Uh, so this is the amount of money I had up at that day. This is the day I started on. That's the X coordinate. So this is the day, start day. And so if I go out to a point here, that's the amount of money I have if I sold it at that particular day. Um, so the partial solutions are all lines. So very similar to the last problem where they were all um, parabolas. So let's look at a few cases. So we could have a case here. You have something with a higher slope. And the thing to notice is this is always better. So this one completely overtakes that one. So I'll say this is always better as soon as it becomes active. Um, so that's a machine that had a really cheap resale value is one way you could look at it uh, potentially. Uh, maybe it's not um, overworking itself then. Uh, another thing that could happen is I pay for it. So selling this machine right now and then buying this new machine down here, it only intersects once. So if something with a higher higher slope ends up becoming better later, but the the key observation here is this intersects only once. Okay, so let's take a look at what some of these um, things could end up looking like. What we'd like to do is maybe that's a machine we could buy. There might be a machine that's available a bit later, gets bought. So let's move this down a bit. And maybe this machine gets bought even later and then gets caught up there. And what you'll notice is we want to ride the chain of max profit. So right now, this is the best solution. It's going on. And then eventually, this becomes the best solution, and it's going on. And then this becomes the best solution, and it's going on. And you'll notice that the shape right here, if you keep forming these lines, looks a lot like a convex hull. So it's like we were maintaining a quadrant of convex hull, so a lower right-hand quadrant of a convex hull. Um, and this is why it's called convex hull optimization. So this resembles convex hull. And really what's going on here is we're maintaining a convex envelope. Uh, well, I guess the envelope would be things above us. So I guess it's the line. So maybe it's not fully an envelope, but sometimes you maintain, you care about the region up here too. Um, maybe I, I'll take that away. But I'm basically forming a convex region by using these lines. And I'd like to know what's the, the maximum of all these lines at any given time. So if I take a stab here, I want to know that that's the max. If I take a stab here, I want to know that's the max. And it's a different line. Um, but as these slopes increase, uh, one of these lines could overtake the other. <laughs> so what we'd like to prevent, though, is things like this. So we have a line. We have another line, but then we could have a day that starts later in a really steep curve right here. And once again, we have this problem of time overtaken. If we have a data structure that's going to tell us what's the maximum at any given time, we need to know that, hey, this guy is the maximum. So something with a really small slope is going to be the maximum. And so eventually it gets overtaken by the thing with slightly greater slope. 
then eventually gets overtaken by the thing with slightly greater slope. So the only reason we keep around something with smaller slope is because it's optimal right now. But something with larger slope could eventually overtake it. But you've got to worry about these cases like this, where something that started later has a higher slope, doesn't necessarily have to even start later, just has to have a higher slope, um, ends up overtaking something earlier than something later that has a lower slope. So we'd like to maintain a data structure sorted by slopes because the thing on the bottom of that data structure, the thing with the least amount of slope will be our optimal solution right now. And the things that go as you go up the data structure are going to be things that eventually become better as you go, as you follow this, ride, basically ride the chain of best solutions again, going up the uh, convex, convex hull here formed by these lines. So that's what I'd like to do. So what we're going to create is an uh, invariant on our data structure that we'd like to maintain. It's going to look um, <clears throat> the way this works. <coughs> and in this case, the slope of our line, so the slope of our line is the price that are basically the amount of money that the machine is making for us on a given day. And so the invariant is I'm going to take a slope of the first one. If the slope of the first one is less than the slope of the second one is less than the slope of the third one, then the thing I'd like to ensure, if that holds, is the time that j gets overtaken by i is strictly less than the time that k gets overtaken by i. And the reason for that is I'll just have to look at the bottom of my data structure. And as soon as something overtakes something else, I just take that best minimum at that time and I use it for my optimal answer. OK, so the first thing to realize is if we're running through the days, things are going to generate different prices at different days. So I could come across something that's machine one and something that's machine two and something that's machine three. And this could be generating a hundred. Uh, this could be generating one dollar. This could be generating a hundred. This could be generating four. Maybe something later generates fifty dollars per day, and they're not coming in in order. So I can't use a deck like I did last time because the slopes are not in order. I might have to insert this thing dynamically based on its slope. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use a binary search tree because they have that dynamic insertion we know and love. And so I'll use a binary search tree to hold that. Now, I'm not going to implement a whole binary search tree here. Um, I've got Java or C++. So if you're in Java, you can use a tree set to implement this problem. If you're in C++, you can use a multi set to implement this problem. Uh, both will work equally well. Uh, upper bound and lower bound are excellent functions in C++ for dealing with this problem in multi-set. In tree set, there's two functions we're going to be using that will help us out. That's higher and lower, and they're going to figure out how to um, do things here. So how do we maintain our invariant if we're inserting things into a, a binary search tree as opposed to inserting them to the top or bottom of our data structure if it was at a, a deck? So here's my binary search tree. And so it's basically, uh, instead of a binary search tree, I'm just thinking of it as a list going top to bottom. And here's my insertion point. So it's increasing by slope. You could imagine I have a line down here. Above that, I have a line like this. Above it, I have a line like this. Above it, I have a line like this. Maybe they all start in different places. As I go up this data structure, it's increasing slope or increasing in price. So I'll find where the insertion point is. <clears throat> the important thing is this invariant already exists on my data structure. That's what it means to maintain it. So to maintain it after inserting this node, I just have to look at everything above me, make sure that everything with higher slope maintains that invariant. So I treat it like a stack coming from the bottom. And then uh, below me, 
look for everything that has slope less than me and look to maintain that invariant for things below me. And so once I insert it into my data structure going into this position, I can just maintain these invariants in both directions. Pretty cool. Let's go code this thing. So uh, really, it's not going to be much of a change from the code we had when we had the n squared version. Now what we're going to be doing is inserting things into a tree set instead of a deck. So let's start coding. So this one is the last part, but it's also the hardest part. OK, so how does our solution change? the comparator on my solution right now. Um, so I'll say it implements comparable. What I'm going to ensure on my data structure is basically ensure that it's sorted by slope correctly. <coughs> good okay so that's what's going to be in a tree set for me so i need to replace this bag with the tree set of solutions i'm going to call this thing hull um, because it resembles a convex hull uh, i could pretty much call it anything that doesn't really matter and Taking the money I have currently, loop through the partial solutions. OK, so I need to modify a few things. Um, when I add it, I'm going to have to maintain the invariant. Down here, I'm going to have to make sure I have the optimal money earned at a given time. So I need to replace this. I want the maximum money I could possibly earn. Uh, that's going to be the thing with the least slope. So kind of silly, but the. Uh, the line at the bottom of the tree set is going to be my optimal answer. <clears throat> but I need to maintain my, I need to basically maintain my time overtaken. I need to make sure that the money I'm earning right now is good enough uh, to be the optimal answer. So basically, if I have at least two elements, I need to ensure that the top two things uh, in the tree set uh, are working. So whole dot first and then solution okay. whole dot higher. I'll take the first two elements of my whole. Those are um, the thing with the least slope, thing with the second most slope. And if it does maintain that property that this is still the best at this time, um, then I'm going to keep it around. <coughs> so I'll do first that money earned. That's my first big change. So if I if I'm basically making more money properly right now, then, then I'm good. Nothing's wrong. Otherwise, what I need to do is take the first one away, remove it from the bottom of my data structure. It's no longer optimal. And from this point on, the second machine is always going to be better on any given day than this machine in terms of that hole. I'll pull it out. <coughs> OK, so now, now what I need to do is if I have at least one element, I need to update max money.
and that's going to be my max money so far. So that's all I need to do. That's written perfectly fine, nothing wrong with that. Okay. So that should maintain my maximum money. I can get rid of this bag thing. Um, at the very end, I need to loop through all possible functions that I'm maintaining in my data structure. So I'll just keep them in whole. <coughs> and I'll just loop through everything and take the max money. So one thing I could do at the very end is I could make sure I'm maintaining that invariant where the bottommost thing is the optimal value. Um, but this hole is at most order n in size, and I'm only doing this operation once. So I'm just going to loop over everything and take the best one at d. Being a little bit lazy there. Okay, so uh, this is where it gets complicated. I have a solution I'd like to add. Um, so I have this new solution, new thing in my data structure. Um, what I'd like to do is find... Basically, if something has the exact same value as me in my data structure. So I'll, I'll take, um, need to take a look at tree set. So one thing I don't want to have happen is I don't want two things in this data structure to have exactly the same slope because I'm in Java and I'm using tree set. So it eliminates duplicates. Uh, I could have tie breaking procedures based on the day. Um, but I really don't want to do that. So I'm going to maintain some extra information. <coughs> so I need to find this element and pull it out of the data structure. So the easiest way to do that looks like it's going to be ceiling. Um, so I'll do that. Uh, well, it's same. So I'll do whole dot, I'll do floor. Okay, you can do floor. And if uh, something's there and it happens to have the same money per day, I think it's called money per day, right? Yeah. I end up having the same money per day as what I'm currently adding. And I need to look at each of them and make a make a decision right now on which one which one's going to be better. Um, and it all comes down to the previous money. So if same dot previous money. Oh, I can actually the best way to do this is just look at the money earned. So if um, the money earned. Is exactly the same as what I or is uh, greater than or equal to otherwise I need to get to remove it so this just ensures that no two lines have the same slope I don't want to have parallel lines in my data structure and I don't want to have two things have the same slope right next to each other. Uh, just kind of a special caveat in terms of my data structure. All right, so now we have a slight issue. What we need to do is we need to do two things. We need to add our new line into the middle of this data structure, maintain everything above us to maintain that invariant above us. Uh, and then I need to look at everything below me in this data structure and make sure it ha it maintains this invariant as well. Um, I think I need to also handle intermediate cases, but we'll we'll look at that in a second. <laughs> so. Um, I need to look at something above me. All 
I need to look at something too above me. And now I need to check my invariant. Okay, so how do I check my invariant? Well, we have to do the time overtaken thing again. Um, so I could, my options are I could check if the two lines intersect. And if the two lines intersect, that, that gives me the time overtaken. Um, once again, I'm lazy. I happen to know the right thing is going, the thing right of me when I do this check is going to have higher slope. It eventually overtakes me. So I'm just going to binary search for the day overtaken. Um, but you can implement this a variety of ways. doesn't really matter. Uh, so low, what should low be? Ooh. So it's just the maximum of the two positions. And then high is just going to be low. I'm going to do the same trick again. Um, basically, <laughs> so I need to look at the, the right curve. I'll do that same binary trick again, binary search trick again. Loop through. Okay, so that's going to save the very first time this gets overtaken into high. And that'll be my binary search value. So whenever this right-hand side overtakes this left-hand side, um, that's going to happen. I'm also assuming that the slope of this is going to be strictly less than the slope of right-hand side um, when I'm using this function. And so now I have my time overtaken function. <laughs> okay, so now I need to check my invariant. So if uh, so, my first time is going to be my second time is going to be this, and so if t one. So what I'd like to maintain is T1 is less than T2. That's the variant I would like to maintain. So if that's not the case, um, or if that is the case, then my invariant is officially maintained, and I can just break out of this. OK, so we, we do need to do one more thing. Um, there is one check that does need to get made. So I'm, I'm going to reuse same here. I'm going to do a whole dot ceiling of this part. Let's look at ceiling and floor. Uh,
No, I want I want higher. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I want to look at this higher element, and if it's if there is something higher than me, and um, basically what I want to do is I want to make sure that this thing when I buy it isn't already um, being overtaken by the thing above me, um, because if that if that's happening, then then I have oh I should actually. Yeah, let's do above and below. So one one tricky thing um, about implementing this like this is I also have to check if the thing immediately above me or the immediately thing below me, if the thing I'm adding um, doesn't maintain an invariant itself, then I I might be irrelevant immediately um, by the thing that's higher than me in the tree set. And if that's the case, if I'm if I'm irrelevant immediately, or or if uh, this thing below me, uh, basically it's the time that the thing above me overtakes the thing below me, then I'll never be on the whole. I'll never be relevant. Uh, so I need to basically just check for that. Um, so I'll do below that time overtaken um, this new partial solution. If that is greater than or equal to, if that's less than, yeah, basically if it, if it takes me longer to be overtaken, then what's above me in slope. So if it, it takes me longer to overtake what's below than what's above me in slope, uh, then I just need to continue. I, I don't want to um, work from here anymore. Okay. <clears throat> and so then this piece, I, I need to maintain this invariant on things above me. OK, so what I'll do is remove the thing that was higher than me. Because that's not satisfying my invariant anymore. Um, what's immediately above me is I overtake it to uh, the thing. It like that middle piece is no longer being relevant in terms of my invariant. Okay, so let's let's do below, and this will behave in a very similar manner. I'll look one below me. I also need to look two below me. Potentially. And I need to look at the times overtaken. So T1 is going to be starting from low two. I need to check. Um, time that low gets a, overtakes it. And then I also need to know the thing that's two down, when does it overtake me? <laughs> and if my invariant checks out, I need to get out of here. Otherwise, I need to remove myself from the hole. All right, remove the piece below me from the hole um, because I'm overtaking it too fast. This new thing that's being added is overtaking it too fast. OK, so if I get through these invariant checks, it's going to hold for the rest of the data structure. Once I hit a stopping point, um, it basically ensures that I've got this nice sloping. Uh, you might be thinking, well, I've got all these while loops that are running really slow, but you'll notice in every piece of the while loop, I'm removing a partial solution. 
Uh, so it amortizes over the whole problem in terms of everything is only getting added to the um, hole once and everything is only getting added to the, or removed from the hole once. Um, so the runtime is actually okay in an amortized sense. And so that's my hole. Uh, at least that should be my hole. Okay, so let's see if this crazy thing works. Cannot find symbol S. Let's take a look at that. Uh, la, 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 la. Oh, I have to look at the first thing in the hole. Yikes. I have to do part and not par. So this is my partial solution. All oh, right, money earned. Once again, I made everything ints, and that is problem. Ooh. This is also an int. So let's see if it passes samples. Yikes. Not even close. Uh, 71. Oof. Oh, right. I just check if the two don't even matter, and then I can move on. Ooh, going to have a big bug here. It's not finding the max. So let's find out where this bug is. Um, what I will do is debug it this way. It's very easy to mess this one up. So just the way I'm going to debug this is Going to have my solution here and loop over it everything as opposed to look at what's the minimum uh, and make sure that piece of the code is not so i could be removing an optimal piece too early and that would be my bug um, so that's basically what i'm checking for hmm very interesting getting way too much things. Um, oh, right. <laughs> that day. <coughs> yeah. So I have a bug down here. Somewhere in this code of removing things that are optimal at the moment. Um, so I'm going to assume things that are the same size should have been removed. Um, what's higher, what's above me, what's below me. Let's make sure I didn't get any of these inequalities backwards. I'll uh, say I think that's backwards. Okay, so the time that so I basically don't even want to consider me if 
Um, I overtake below at the same time above overtakes below. Ooh. I might want that. So the reason I don't want below here, uh, I'm going to change my invariant up a little bit here, is because what could happen is they could overtake at exactly the same time, and I could have above um, end up being better at that exact moment. Uh, but I wouldn't be better than above. Right? Uh, or I might be better than above at that time it's overtaken right at that moment. So. I'm going to change this around and rework my time overtaken to be a little bit different. Um, I might just rework everything to do that. I think that might be prudent. So you can you can maintain. So one thing about uh, convex hull optimization is you can change um, your invariant to be ever so slightly different. You could be instead of being the time that you overtake that middle piece, you could just be the time that I overtake the thing right before me and the thing after me, um, the time it gets overtaken. So if I have three things, A, B, and C, where A is less than B is less than C. And we, we know that this basically maintains that time overtaken, uh, the time that B gets overtaken by C, A, um, is we need to maintain it's less than the time that C gets overtaken by A. Sometimes what you can do is just change this to be a B. Uh, and basically what this ensures instead is that intermediate piece, even though they might overtake at the same time, that intermediate piece might actually be better um, at that intermediate moment. Uh, so you do have to be a little bit careful there. Uh, so I think I'm going to maintain a different invariant there. And, uh, on this one, I might I think I need to have that different invariant because I could have weird cases. Uh, for the parabola, it's not so important. Um, so I'll do the same one here. So this is two below. I'll go one below, two time overtaken. Okay, and that should maintain my invariance. Um, it's nice that the sample caught that. Because no, that would have been a pain to debug. Or maybe it still has a bug. Let's see if we can get these last pieces working. Money per day. Cool. Ooh, that's a really big bug. Yeah, because it should have been money earned um, on that particular day. That That's when I know that this is suboptimal. So basically what I have is I have two lines. I want to exclude the line that's above um, or below the other parallel line. So that way I only have one line with the same slope. <coughs> OK, let's see if I can find some other bugs. If not, I'm going to have to post out the Pernef debugging here. So that's two above me. That's two below me. Maintain the invariant. Take a quick look again. Yeah, that looks better.
Okay. So now it works if we don't slide anything. So what I'm going to do here is move some of my helper code around. So now I'll maintain the invariant on the low end. Okay, so let's let's do um, works. Uh oh. Something is really slow. It appears to be getting the right answers. Did I not compile? No, it appears to just be very, very slow. So let's see if we have an infinite loop somewhere. Because this should be very fast. It shouldn't be this slow. Oh, yeah, I called it start, not day. Oh, no, it would be day. Okay. And so then it just freezes. Hmm. Looks like an infinite loop. But in which piece?
Hmm. Let's find out what loop what loop it's dying in. So while that's running, we'll see see if we can get this very last piece to work and see what we can find out this last bug is. Yeah. But roughly, this is convex hole optimization. Uh, take a little bit for it to hang. Thanks to everyone, too, that uh, has been sticking around and watching this episode. OK. So it is hanging after that second A. Take a look at where that is in the code. See if we can find this last bug. Hmm. Oh. It's in floor. That or remove is not as fast as we think it is. Hmm. I have a hunch I know what's going on. We're going to remove this debug print statements. And I bet I'm running out of memory. And it's not actually a bug. OK. So uh, important lesson on, um, on Java. If you use the default memory, you don't have much memory in the JVM. If you run out of memory in Java, what it starts doing is it start the, the garbage collector starts thrashing. Uh, it starts running the garbage collector after every single operation, looking for more memory when it needs more memory. Uh, so if it gets starved of memory, and I think that's what's going on here. So we're going to... Give it a try. Huh. Nope. That does not appear to be our bug. It's just completely caught.
So it's going to be one of these functions. Oh. Wonder if it's my binary search. Does my binary search have a bug? Let's find out. Ah. Uh. Ooh, let's look at the problem statement here. I think I know why this bug was happening. Oh, wouldn't it be day zero? Oh, I don't want to do integer.max value. So let's do then it hangs. Low equals high, high times equals two. So the money earned currently on the one last. I'm basically looking for the time when J overtakes I. So I did something very backwards. Yeah, so I did my binary search backwards. And that's my bug. And that's why it was also infinite looping. Big bug, big bug. And so that appears to be working now. Uh, and I can't tell, let's uh, see if I have a diff program installed on this. I might not. Ooh, more bugs. I'll do one last check on a few things in my convex wall optimization and see what's going on.
I think I'm going to do is uh, decide to end tonight right now. But the the thing I will do is I'll post this code in the live blog or in the algorithms live blog after um, with the bug fix um, when I find it. But I do have a bug in this code for um, finding the convex hole or maintaining my invariant on my convex hull. So it is a subtle bug somewhere that I don't think I'm going to be able to find very easily um, without some intense debugging. So before signing off, just a quick reminder, uh, next week will be a different, uh, different day um, than usual for Algorithms Live and um, Yep, and we'll, we'll be covering uh, centroid decomposition, so divide and conquer on trees. Uh, and I hope in, hope to sh show different techniques for that, and uh, then we'll go into more complicated algorithms in future weeks. Uh, so thanks for tuning in this week. It's a longer episode than usual. I couldn't quite get the second problem working bug-free. It's a little more complicated. Uh, I do think... There is a slightly easier way to handle um, implement or maintaining the convex hole invariant on this one. I've, I've coded this problem before a lot while back, and I can't remember um, the simplification for maintaining this invariant above and below. I'll be posting about it in the blog. I'll, I'll look into this code, see what's going on. So thanks for tuning in this week. See you guys next week.